Uh, again, thanks so much for being here. And I'm just going to introduce our first speaker. Um, so our first speaker is Anne McLaughlin. She's Associate Professor of Psychology at North Carolina State University. She directs the Learning, Aging, and Cognitive Economics Lab at NC State and co-directs the Games Through Gaming Lab. So I know she has great students in her uh, Human Factors class that we regularly steal for our UX, UX Lab's need at Epic. So thank you, Anne, for providing great people. And please welcome Akmai Lopi. Great. Well, OK, so before I get started, since I'm the first speaker, I'd really like to get a sense of who you all are. Uh, so could you raise your hand if you work in game user experience or game user research? OK, that's a lot. OK, great. And how about working in game development? Lots of developers. And how about um, just general usability, not necessarily games? And how about students, academics? <laughs> Got the woot for that, great. Okay, it is true, Celia does steal all of my students and I'm pretty happy about it. So, Okay, well what I'd like to talk to you about today are some thoughts on using human factors methods to both measure and manipulate game user experience. And really what I'm going to talk about is a way of thinking, um, but it's a way of thinking that we don't, we might think it's a little intuitive, but we tend to be biased in the way we use that thinking. And so I'm going to go into some detail about how we can fight against some of our cognitive biases that make us maybe not look at the data or collect the data in ways that would be especially helpful. So what I'm mostly going to talk about is a way to avoid this bias by using a classic method from human factors called signal detection theory. So signal detection theory is about as old a way of thinking as this book looks which is old. But what hasn't changed is our bias towards looking for certain kinds of evidence when we do user research, and we tend to ignore some other variables. But these are variables that are specifically codified by signal detection theory and can help us to avoid those biases. Let's look at an example. So signal detection is any kind of signal or game element that you want your players to attend to or not attend to. It could be something like the heads-up display for an interface. It could be the area of a map that you want people to notice or not notice. Um, interpretation of different icons with subtle color changes. Anytime a player has to make a decision that's under uncertainty, which is most games, is when you can use signal detection theory to help your designs. One of my favorite examples comes from a game called Team Fortress 2. Does anyone play that? Okay, we got a few. So, what I love about part of this is that here, signal detection was made deliberately difficult. Um, it, for the rest of you, it's a capture the flag type game with two opposing teams. And you can play different character classes, and one of those character classes is a spy, so you want to be disguised. Um, now, the spy can have a sort of special ability where it, it, he or she looks like a member of the opposing team, right down to the name. But there's still some cues that someone is a spy so that you could be able to detect them. But if it were too easy to detect a spy, it wouldn't be very spy-like. It would be kind of lame. So you can do a lot of things to see if someone's a spy. One of the ways to do that is to shoot them. And if they get hurt, they are not on your team. <laughs> and if they don't get hurt, they were on your team. Uh, but, you know... There's sort of a low penalty to that because if they're on your team, they don't get hurt, but there's sort of a penalty for annoying people if you do that constantly. Um, and there's also a penalty for time. You're spending time doing that. So it behooves a good player to be able to recognize spy-like cues um, before deciding whether they're going to shoot. So that's, that's a classic example of signal detection. So lots of, design, or lots of decisions went into that design. And um, I'm just going to show you an example, since this is a game that's already out there, of how you could use signal detection theory to test questions like that and test the impact of design decisions. Um, it'll show you also how you can weigh payoffs and punishments to change player behavior to how you want it to be. So everything is done by putting percentages in this really simple grid. We've got two columns here. On the left side, we have... Um, when the signal is present. So for the Team Forces example, that's when the person that you see in front of you is a spy. So the signal is present. And then on the um, right side, we have when the signal is absent. So it's a team member. It's not a spy. Um, and so each of those columns is going to be where you would put those two. Now, there's also a, the most important part of this is what the player thinks they see. So here you have the rows 
which are the decisions that the player is going to make. Do they see the person and think it's a spy, or do they see the person and think it's not a spy? So by using this, you can cross them and say, okay, well, if the player sees the spy and recognizes it is a spy, we would call that a hit. So that's an accurate uh, assessment. But if the player decides that what they see is not a spy, but it is actually a spy, we call that a miss. So that would be a problem if someone gets into your base and you don't catch that. Then there are also examples where the signal is absent. So the person is your team member, but you think they're a spy and you shoot them. That would be a false alarm. And then if the person is not a spy and you recognize they're not a spy, then that would be what we call a correct rejection. So you actually have two things that are accurate. The hits and the correct rejections are both accurate responses, but only one seems to be an action. So that's one of the biases we have is that we ignore those correct rejections. We tend to naturally consider hits and misses. Whenever we think about accuracy, we think about hits and misses. And we are biased against remembering to consider false alarms and correct rejections. Um, Team Fortress 2 got accolades for collecting long-term player metrics so you could see how you did over time and see all these logs. But I can't find any logs for any game that collect false alarms and correct rejections. If you all know of any that are out there, please send them to me because that would really be my idea of a fun weekend would be to look at that. Um, but I couldn't find it. Okay. Now, another thing to consider is that whenever you play around with the, um, the way a player is going to behave, you're going to have a trade-off. So, for example, if you really want players to not have any misses, then it's going to up their false alarm rate. And you have to take that into consideration because that can be frustrating or upsetting to a player to have lots of false alarms. Uh, an example here could also come from the medical field where you have, um, if you want to have a test that's not 100% accurate to detect a, t a kind of cancer and you don't want to miss any of that cancer, you're going to have to have a ton of people who are told they have cancer but don't. So you're going to up that false alarm rate. Now, it goes the other way too. Maybe you want to have more false alarms. Maybe you have a jump scare kind of game where false alarms are building up the tension. So um, here's an example of one game called Until Dawn. And a review I found says it looks like they took kind of specific steps to uh, keep that false alarm rate appropriately high um, by even limiting how players can interact with the game. So no matter what, uh, my conclusion here is that false alarm rates, I think, are a variable that you want to measure, but we tend to be biased against collecting it or even considering that information. Now, we're not alone in being, that kind of, in being biased in that way. It took until the mid-20th century for signal detection theory to take off in general, and then it was for radar operators. Um, and then it was decades later that it finally started being used in medicine, where it's super useful. And then it was decades after that that we started using it for things like airport scanning um, and also for things like law enforcement. So, you know, when officers are being trained to shoot or don't shoot, that's a classic signal detection case. So anytime a person has to make a decision under certainty or find a signal in noise, you can use signal detection theory. Now, hopefully I've convinced you about the value of it, um, and I'm going to go a little bit into the theory part behind it, behind that grid I showed you. I'm not going to go into the math, but all of it's available online, and people have even made Excel templates that you just plug and play, and it gives you lots of really great information, so you, you don't have to do it yourself. So what's behind the grid? Generally, players are looking for some sort of signal, like are you a spy, and it's on a continuum from maybe a very faint signal to a very strong signal, and that's the x-axis you see there. And the y-axis is going to be the frequency of occurrence, so when do most of the signals or non-signals occur? Um, but you'll see I have two possible distributions. One's blue and one's red. The blue distribution are things that actually are the signal, so you do see a spy, and then red are the things that aren't the signal, like your team member. And so let's look at a real example, and I chose a game that is almost as classic as signal detection theory itself. Does anybody remember Doom 2? <clears throat> okay, I'll show how old I am. All right, so let's say you're playing this game back in the 90s, and you might see a demon. And depending on where the setting is, maybe you recognize it quickly or not. And when you see something, you judge it on an internal scale that you have of, well, how demony is that thing? So how demony would you all say this picture is? Pretty demony or not very demony? Pretty, yeah, I'd say pretty demony, yeah. But what if you saw this in front of you? How demony would you say that is? Moderately less demony, okay. So then let's see how this could play out when you really have that spectrum. 
All of these screenshots either have a demon or don't. Um, on the top row with the blue border, every one of those pictures has that same demon in it. But you can see on the left side, they're kind of invisible and they're barely able to be seen as sort of an outline, moving all the way to the right where it's totally clear. So you've got that spectrum of the signal. The bottom row, there's no demon in any of those pictures. The signal is not present. But you can see that some are trickier than others. And as you move right, it seems kind of more possible that there might be a demon, but you're not totally sure. So as a player, you want to shoot the demon from the top row, and you want to hold off on the bottom or know that it's not a demon. So let's visualize the same thing with the signal detection distributions on top to show how it works. So now we've got the same pictures, but we have those distributions on top. And if you look at the sort of the blue curve, it's over the blue diagram. And you'll see most demons are in about the five to seven range. The numbers are arbitrary, but like all good scales, I made this one go to 11. So if you look at that blue curve, most demons are falling at the highest point of the curve, but there are a few that are lower and a few that are higher. Same thing with the, um, the red curve, where there's no demon in those pictures, but there are a few that look more demony, a few that look less. So when deciding if something's a demon or not, you have to draw a line in the sand. Somewhere in that x-axis, the player says, if it looks more demony than this, I'm going to shoot it like it's a demon, and if it looks less demony than that, I'm not. So let's just say this is a personal rule I follow. I, I, maybe I can't verbalize it, but if I see anything that looks more than about 5.8 on the demon scale, I'm going to shoot it like it's a demon. Um, you could also call this my response bias. Now, the shaded blue area there, those are all the demons I'm going to miss using that decision line. So if I use that as my decision line, these are the ones that are going to get through, and I'm not going to know what they were. Um, on this area, the yellow area, these are all the ones I'm going to correctly identify. So that's kind of a lot. I think I'm doing pretty good. Um, but then here, that itty-bitty orange area, those are the false alarms I'm going to have. Because you can see they're on the side of my decision where I'm saying, yes, it's a demon, but they're actually from the red distribution, meaning they're not. So those are the false alarms that I'm going to get. So I'm not going to get too many, actually, with that decision point. Okay. Um, and then this orange area would be correct rejection. So again, remember, that's accurate. So now you can see how all of that fits into the grid of the percentages we were talking about. So you can play with two variables as a developer or user experience researcher to get the kind of player response you want. You can either make that line move around, or you can change the signal. Now, if you can change the signal, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, you can make it more or less different if you have control over it. You could say, I'm not going to have anything in the game that's pink, so it's going to make the pink demon stand out more. So that makes the signal stronger, for example. You could have, I'm not going to have any invisible demons, or I'm going to have all invisible demons. So you can, if you can control a signal, you can change that. But you can also change the payoffs and the penalties for whether or not someone shoots at something. And that kind of, um, that kind of change is when those trade-offs happen, where if you're going to have fewer misses, you're going to have more false alarms. So for example, let's see if I can scroll here. So for example, what if I said I'm going to speed up the demons so that they run at you really fast? Which way do you think that would move the um, strategy or response bias line? Yeah, like they're running at you fast. It's better to just shoot and ask questions later, right? So you could change the bias by changing something about the attribute. Um, this also is why you can see that signal detection is very important in law enforcement, or should be. So you can see this in different game variations already out there. So it's sort of a natural experiment in the world. Um, if you have a game like Counter-Strike, then you have to decide if a target that you see in front of you is a teammate or not. And you might need some sort of conservative response bias or conservative signal detection. Because if you shoot that person, whether they're your teammate or not, that person can't get their health back. And there's the peer pressure of not hurting your teammates. It looks really bad. So that might really change your response bias about whether you shoot. Whereas if you play a game that has easy health that you can get back, or medics, or no friendly fire, then you have a more liberal response strategy where almost anything is worth shooting at. So whether it's conscious or not, these games are manipulating those four quadrants that I talked about earlier. OK, let's look at one last real example. This is um, one I found from GDC of this year. And it was done by um, Tom Matthews, who's a senior engineer at um, 343 Industries at Microsoft. So if you look in the upper picture, that is a, a, a picture from when Halo 5 was first released, and that was the color of the blue team. And they recognized by looking at the small graph on the right that in all the different game variations, 
uh, it looked like blue had an advantage. You can basically see that when it comes to wins and losses over 100%, basically blue is always sort of over the 50% mark and shouldn't be because people are randomly assigned to teams. So they changed the blue color, they changed the signal of the blue team, and now it looks like it does in the bottom there. Um, but they basically sort of did this with signal detection, although without consciously saying that. Um, they took the number of times a player went through an area and was killed and divided by the number of times they went through an area at all and basically got a sense of ha how fatal different areas of maps were. And as you can see um, on this one map of an area, the darker red means that that's when red team had more fatalities. Darker blue means that blue had more fatalities. So overall, you see a lot of red because red is not doing as well as blue. Um, and then if you look at this one area that was dark blue, they could say, okay, well, now we know that people are having a problem with signal detection. Let's see why. This was the scene in that particular dark blue area of the map. And as you can see, it's sort of a great place for either someone in the red team to hide or maybe to trigger accidental firing as soon as the blue team entered that because there's a big red um, mark in the middle there. Um, and I think that this is just one example of how big data from players after a game has been released and signal detection is coming of age for games. And I think that the games of the future are going to need this even more. Um, so... We might think that no one gets hurt or dies in video games, but now that we're going to have things like augmented reality and virtual reality games, I think we need to consider that. So let's look at an example of someone playing a virtual reality game with the Vive. Yeah. <laughs> so... These, story, these stories are everywhere. She did have chaperone on. I heard someone say that. Um, so there's something called the chaperone that is basically helping you with signal detection. It's supposed to tell you where the walls are. Apparently, if you're running fast enough, chaperone can't keep up. So there is a great example of the need for signal detection. And I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I do know it will not have perfectly automated systems because the military can't do it games aren't going to be able to do it. So we have to be able to consider the misses and false alarms and how a multitude of either is going to affect your player experience. Okay, before I leave, what I'm not proposing. I do not say that you should make games easier. Okay, I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying that the whole point of thinking in terms of signal detection theory is that you can have the game how you want it. It can fulfill your vision as a developer or your company's vision as a developer. How easy or hard that is is up to you. Um, if you can control the signal, that's one way to do it. And if you control the payoffs, that's another. I'm also not proposing um, paint by the numbers. So uh, I believe game development is a holistic process. This is just one tool um, among many. So I know that you, know, you really need to be thinking maybe about signal detection theory in addition to other methods. And again, um, not using it in a vacuum. There are a lot of different ways in which we can improve the user experience of games, and signal detection, I think, is just one tool for our toolbox. So my take-home message is that we've seen it across domains for 70 years now, and it takes a while to adopt it, but that um, now is the time that we have the ease of data collection, we have the presence of metrics and telemetry um, all rolled in, and we have more and more common practice of having things like paid betas where we can gather that information before releasing it or even aftermarket patches that fix the game based on signal detection. So I think that that makes it ideal for now to be the time that we can use it to improve user experience in games. And I'd like to thank some people who helped me with this and answer any questions. <laughs>